So uh, here's the program that we're on, Faraday's Law. Um, this idea that you can create an EMF that's every bit as real as the EMF from a battery, but it's not from a battery, it's from a changing magnetic flux of time. So the magnetic flux has to change with time. So remember, that is the most important thing. You can have all the flux you want, but if it doesn't change with time, you will not get anything happen. So if we go back and we look at the ingredients of flux, there's lots of different ways to change the flux. Changing the magnetic field strength itself is just one of them. So if any one of these ingredients, N, B, A, theta, change with time, and again, again, it's important that it change with time, then we'll get EMF. So I'm going to go through these, and I've numbered them in the order I'll go through them. The first one I did was the magnetic field change strength itself. That's probably the most complicated place to start. So uh, number one, I did last time. And we had an example where I had one loop catching flux such that it would catch maximum flux. The area was constant. Um, so the EMF ended up being generated by a change in the magnetic field with time. So I had a magnetic field that was growing with time, and that's where my flux changed, and therefore my EMF originated. So Today, what I hope to do is to get through factors two and three. So let's change the area, um, and let's change the angle. So let's see what we can do with that. My next example is an area change. So the area has to change with time. So again, so it's hard to emphasize that it's always got to be a time evolution. So that's a little bit harder to do because I need the whatever is catching my flux or counting my flux, I need it to actually get bigger or smaller. So that um, I'm going to have to contrive a loop that can get bigger. Obviously, if you have a wire loop, normally if you try to make it bigger, you'll just break it. So we have to uh, um, construct this thing so that this is possible. So here's what I'm going to do. Let's have the external magnetic field. It's going to have a point like that. It's going to be uniform. And it's going to be constant in time. So uniform means it's the same everywhere in space and also have it be constant in time. That's not where the action is going to be. The action is going to be I'm going to construct myself a loop that can change area. So I'm going to basically put in a movable side to the loop. Right? If you just have a piece of wire, you try to make it bigger, you'll probably snap it. So here's how I'm going to do it. I'm going to have three sides that are fixed. And then the way that I'm going to form the fourth side is I'm going to just lay a conducting bar over it like on a rail. So kind of lay the fourth side over like that, and I can slide it back and forth and make the area bigger or smaller. In this case, I'm going to make it bigger by moving this to the right. So you can see that a closed loop is going to be formed with the bar as the fourth side. And if I slide that bar, I can change the area. Um, now, one of the problems, obviously, with making a loop bigger, if I, it's going to the loop is going to have progressively more and more material in it, right? So that's going to be problematic if I have to consider the resistance of the material. If I make the loop bigger, that includes more material. It's going to be more resistance. So I'm going to make my usual approximation that a conducting material doesn't have any resistance anyway, and all the resistance is basically on one side. Okay, so that makes it so that even though I incorporate more and more material into my loop, the resistance is not going to have to evolve with time because that would be uh, another complication. So I'm going to say that all the resistance of the loop is basically here, resistance R. And I'm going to give you the dimension of the loop that doesn't get bigger. I'll call that L. Of course, the other dimension is going to get larger, so I can't talk about um, the width of it. The width is going to evolve the time. And I guess let me go ahead and do this as a, an example problem. But let me do it symbolically just because 
numbers just get in the way of doing some math. Okay? So the givens in this example are going to be um, the resistance of the loop, the length of that fixed dimension, and also the initial velocity of this uh, bar that forms the fourth side. Oh, and I guess I need to give you the magnetic field as well. So the external magnetic field. And just so I don't have to write external every time, let's just take B as being B external. So those are my givens. And when I ask my questions, instead of giving num numerical answers, I'm just going to make sure that they're expressed in terms of those givens. So let me pose my questions. My questions are going to be, what's the direction and size of the induced current? And uh, and then I guess, as usual with these example problems, um, B is just going to be kind of more general rambling about the system, just discussing aspects of the system that I think are interesting. Um, maybe I'll try to structure that a little bit, but basically I just want to talk about what's going on here. Um, okay. So that's the setup. Let's, uh, let's go for it. Uh, in order to get the direction of the induced current, we can always use Lenz's law. So Lenz's law basically says that the induced current will flow such as to uh, try to fight whatever flux change we're trying to make. Now here, the reason why the flux is going to change is not because the field strength itself is changing, but we're making the area of the catcher bigger and bigger and bigger. So we're going to catch more and more magnetic field, or count more and more magnetic field through the area of the loop, because the area of the loop itself is getting bigger. So in this case, is a flux increase or decrease? Increase. increase. So that means B induced, does it want to point with the external or against it? Okay. Against it. So we want B induced to be like this. Again, it's not against B external because it's always against B external. It's against B external because the flux is increasing. If I were to shove the bar the other way and make the loop smaller, then it would want to fight that decreasing flux, and in fact, B induced would be with B external. So remember, it's always fighting the change. In this case, because we're trying to increase the flux, B induced is going to oppose the external because it wants to prevent that increase from happening. So now we work backwards. If B induced is going to point like that, which way does the current have to go around? Right hand rule. Counterclockwise. All right, wrap your fingers around I to get B induced like that. Remember, I induced creates B induced. So don't accidentally do it with your thumb with B external. Okay? So B induced has to come out, so I induced goes like this. So it's going to flow around like this. I induced. It's going to go through the resistor, of course. Go like this. And in the bar, it'll flow up. So that's my I induced. Okay. So um, I've got the direction of my I induced. But before I go to get the size, which is Faraday's law, um, I do want to point out to you that explaining why this current starts flowing does not require any tricks or things that we talked about. Uh, we, of course, said that if a magnetic field, a magnetic field is deflective only, right? So a magnetic field can only deflect things that are moving already. It can't pick up charges from rest. So sometimes if, from our perspective, those charges are at rest, we have to invoke that somehow some electric field came into being to pick them up from rest. Uh, so we talked about that last time. This is no such thing. In fact, I would not, don't have to use Lenz's law at all to explain why the current flows like that. I'm going to show you how I could have reasoned that, although in a more complicated manner, just using good old slack rule. So, um, Lenz's law gives the right answer, but it's just a mnemonic or a shortcut. Uh, 
So let me give you an alternative explanation for why the induced current flows the way it does. So I have a magnetic field, the external, and I have a bar, and I suddenly move the bar like this, which means that the charges inside it are moving like that, right? So I got the party started, right? I move these charges in the magnetic field, and the magnetic field says, thank you, I will deflect that, okay? So we can use good old slap rule, right? I slap B into B, forces like this. So the force, the magnetic force, will be like this. And so, this thing will curl up. And it can do that, by the way, because of course it's doing it inside the bar. The bar is moving forward. So the bar is now here, because the bar is moving forward still. So it's able to actually uh, go through that uh, part of the motion just fine, right? That first, uh, whatever that is, quarter of a circle or so, right? It's perfectly fine. And, by the way, look at that direction of that charge, right? That's my induced current. The induced current we said flow like that. There it is, flowing like that. Same answer. I induced. So, whether we use the mnemonic of Lenz's law or we use that good old slap rule, we get the same answer. We move the bar, and the effect of moving the bar is we get the party started with the charges in motion, and then the magnetic field can deflect those into uh, some motion. <coughs> now here's the interesting thing that happens. Uh, they would like to continue to go in a circle like this, right? Now if I do the slap rule, V slapped into V, I get the forces like this, right? They would like to complete the circle, but here's the problem. For the first quarter of a circle, the bar was moving forward, so making that first quarter of a circle was fine because the bar is just moving with you. But now you're trying to go backward, complete the circle, and this bar is still moving forward, so you can't go that way, right? So what happens is, now, this is actually going to persist. So that force, it kind of stalls out there. Right? These charges cannot go backwards, and so they basically get deflected up into an induced current, and then they just flow. The first chance they have, by the way, to go backwards is, of course, over here, right? When they get off of this bar that's moving forward, and they actually get a chance to go over here, where they can actually go that direction, right? So basically, you can think of it like this. They bump against the, the inner edge, the back edge of this bar, all the way as they flow up, and then they can't get where they want to go until they get over there, right? So that actually creates a force against the motion, okay? So there will be, on this entire bar, a force that acts against it. And by the way, um, if you you don't have to go down to the individual charge level to get that. All you have to do is slap that induced current with the external field, right? If you slap I induced into B, the force is against the motion. So we'll find that this is a common theme. This idea of magnetic, it's, you can almost think of it as like magnetic friction. It turns out that a lot of times what happens is that magnetic forces are trying to fight what you're you're trying to accomplish. So there'll be a magnetic force on the bar against the motion. So remember when I said that there's often some macroscopic, see with your own eyes, manifestation of Lenz's law. You don't have to hook up an ammeter to figure out that the current direction you found was right. What you will literally see is you try to give this bar a kick to the right, and it says, hey, please don't change the flux, I don't like it and it'll try to prevent you from doing that, okay? And in fact, if you gave this bar a kick to the right and just walked away, the bar would slide to a stop. Because 
the magnetic force would oppose that motion and bring it to a stop. So there's magnetic friction, or you can think of it as magnetic braking. So you try to increase the flux, and it tries to prevent you from doing that. Okay. So again, Lenz's law in action. So Lenz's law acts against, it tries to fight the flux change. All right. Um, okay, uh, so I want to point out that uh, there is a force against the bar. I'll come back to that later, but for now, let's get back to, uh, uh, we did the direction. Let's get the size of the induced current, okay? So here we pull out Faraday's law again. Faraday's law is what's applied to the size. So we'll go into the flux equation, NVA cos theta. So in this case, I have one loop. So N is one. I also have to decide how this loop is oriented so as to catch flux. So is this oriented to catch uh, maximum flux or minimum flux to the external field? Maximum, right? So we have the field coming in like this into the page, and then this is oriented to catch as much of that as possible. So the angle between the normal line and the magnetic field is zero, and that leads to cosine of zero, which is one. So we're back to just V times A for the flux. And the only difference between that and the previous case is that now it's the B that's constant, and the area is changing. So if I pull out the V from the integral, or integral, sorry, uh, the derivative, which you guys know, theoretically know what that is. This is a thinly veiled derivative, if you take the calculus. Um, so it's a uh, magnetic field that can be taken out of the delta because it's not changing, but the area is the thing that's changing. Now that's where the action is, right? The area is changing with time. So notice the similarities. This is why I preserved this from the last time, right? Here, the area was constant, but the magnetic field was changing. Here, it's the magnetic field that's constant, but the area that's changing, right? So it looks very similar. It's just they switch roles, right? Which one's doing the changing? So um, with that, let me clear this off. because This is why I saved it, so I can point out how similar these two things looked. Um, but now, I need, I need some more space. So let me get rid of this. Okay, all right, so I need to know um, how is the area changing with time? Um, well, if someone gives you A final and A initial, and then you can subtract them and divide by the time it took to make that change, but in this case, it's not quite so simple. So let's take a look at the area. Well, the area is going to always be a rectangle, and while I wasn't given the width of the rectangle, I guess I'll call it x. So the rectangle that forms this area has a fixed uh, dimension L and then a moving dimension, movable dimension x. So I put that in there. And of course, L is also able to be pulled out of the delta because L is not changing. So the only reason why we get an EMF is because the area is changing with time. And the area is only changing with time because one dimension of the area is changing with time, the dimension x. Now what is delta x over delta t? What is it? Uh, the displacement is delta x, but what's delta x over delta t? It's the, well, the rate at which this dimension is changing is this. So we get BLV. So the EMF is caused by the motion of that side, that force side that's moving. And the faster you move that bar, the more EMF you will get. 
And likewise, if you don't move the bar at all, then you don't get any EMF at all. Because, of course, if you don't move that fourth side, you have no flux change with time. The area doesn't change with time, and that's what you need. You need something to evolve with time. All right, so we're pretty much done here. Just pull out Ohm's law. This is the induced current. And double check my rules there. Those are all given variables, so I'm pretty much okay. Um, presumably in a, in a uh, problem web assigned, those would be given to you as numbers and you just throw them in, right? So we've been able to successfully get the direction <coughs> of the current. You can use Lenz's law. I certainly think that's the easiest. I showed you that that was consistent with the slap law, slap rule, but either way, you get the same answer for the direction of the induced current, and then Faraday's law can help us get the size. Okay, are there any questions on what I've done so far? Okay, so that's kind of the um, the uh, formal part of, uh, I guess, doing this as a structured example, but I do want to discuss uh, certain different aspects of this system. And, in fact, this system is probably the best system to show you something important about Lenz's Law. Now, Lenz's Law, we've just characterized as a shortcut to get the induced current direction, but what I aim to show you is that if Lenz's Law weren't the way it is, you would have a violation of energy conservation, which we, of course, know is a big no-no. So I'm going to show you how Lenz's law is just a very strange way of resulting in energy conservation. Um, so let me do that. And uh, so let's just start by talking conceptually. So if I come up to this bar, and I give it a kick. So let's talk about energy forms. So this is from physics one. When you have a, a, a bar that's flying through space, what do we call the energy type that it has? Kinetic energy, right? So we have the kinetic energy of the bar. So that's one type of energy in this system. And we just talked about the fact that when you give this bar a kick, there'll be a magnetic force that acts against it, right? So it's going to slow the bar down. Now, if you're slowing the bar down, you take away its kinetic energy, right? So here's my question. If that, the energy gets taken away from the bar, where does it go? What's that? heat eventually, but of course the resistor is over here. How does the energy get over here? Electrical current. Electrical current. So it goes into electrical energy to drive the current, and then the resistor will sweat it out as heat. Right. So we have that the kinetic energy of the bar goes into electrical energy, and then because there's a resistor, that Basically, resistor, we know, is something that takes electrical energy and sweats it out to the environment, right? If you didn't have the resistor there. Right. <laughs> well, we'd have a problem in our equation for sure, because the EMF, what current would that produce? So I'm going to ignore that. <laughs> okay. All right. So it eventually becomes heat, right? So if I walk up to this system, I give that bar a kick and then walk away, what I'm going to find is that that bar is going to not move forever, it's going to slide to a stop, and that's because its energy got taken to this and then to this. So if I walked up, I give that bar a kick of 5 joules, eventually I'd find that that 5 joules is sweated out as heat to the environment through the resistor. Okay? So the energy's all there, right? And in fact, if I wanted the bar, to not just have a finite uh, slide, I'd have to not just kick it and walk away. I'd have, to, I'd have to push on it continuously, right? Make sure it keeps moving. 
So give it continuous new energy, right? New kinetic energy. Where, so where do I get it? If I'm just sitting there and I'm pushing on it and pushing it and making sure it doesn't slow down, where's that energy coming from? From me, where do I get it? I don't know. Frost Blake, Blake Said this morning. So if you want, an option you can have here is chemical energy, right? If you choose to want to keep the bar moving. And I mention this because I post, uh, there will be an applet on homework seven which shows you one of these bars, and it shows one of these bars is sliding at constant velocity. It doesn't slow down. The only way that could happen is if there is some unseen hand that continues to move it. So I wanted to point that out because that applet, again, it doesn't show a hand attached to the bar, but there must be one because if there wasn't, this would be soon stolen to this, and the kinetic energy of the bar would the bar would stop. Okay. So um, one thing I want to show you. First of all, is that the energy is all still there. We can actually confirm this with calculation. Now, we know, of course, that electric energy gets converted to heat. This is something we've been doing since homework three, right? We calculate usually not the total amount of energy. We calculate the rate of that energy being dissipated with power, right? Can you this ring a bell? So this formula we know P equals IV or I squared over R or V squared over R. So let's just for uh, kicks uh, um, solve for that. And by the way, here's our voltage. So the power dissipated here would just be uh, BLV squared divided by R. So that just went in there. And here's the rate at which electrical energy is converted to heat. All right. So from here to here, we're going to have to uh, appeal a little bit to your uh, <coughs> physics uh, one stuff. So. Um, let me do that. Um, hopefully you remember from Physics 1 that the work done is F delta X cosine theta. Again, I realize I haven't invoked this too much, but let's try it. So in this case, um, the uh, the bar is moving to the right. Of course, this displacement will be something like that. And we're calculating the force here. So what's the angle between the force and displacement? What is it? 180. Cosine of 180 is negative 1. And so let me remind you what negative work is. Negative work means it's being taken away from kinetic energy. So we can see that here. This is negative work. And that's good because we already knew that it went away from kinetic energy to some other form, in this case electrical. So let's calculate the force. Well, that's I L B sine of theta, delta x, and then negative 1. Right? So that's the magnetic force. We can calculate it from the current. Um, first of all, what's the angle between the current and uh, the magnetic field? This is the current magnetic field. Which magnetic field do I use, by the way? This one or this one? The external or the induced? Now, what makes this? Current. Current. So can I use the thing that it made back on the thing that made it? No, it's external, right? So what's the angle between I induced and the external? 90. 90. So that's I of 90, that's 1. All right. Um, so I'm pretty much ready to go. Um, the only thing I need to do is uh, plug in the current, right? 
which I found already, so let me throw in the current. Let me remind you we found the current was BLD over R. So what do we get? Work is, let's, it's going to be a bunch of stuff here. Um, let me pull the minus sign out to the front. I've got a BLV over R times L times B times delta X. And I think I'm good to go. Now I know it looks like a whole big mess, but it's coming together. Now that's the work, right? That's the total amount of energy removed, but let's compare apples and apples, right? Here we're comparing amount of energy, here we're com com comparing the rate, so what do we need to do to make this a rate? Divide by time, so let's do that. The rate is going to be divided by time, and that's convenient by the way, because I need that delta x is just hanging out there like a uh, kind of uh, annoyance. But delta x over delta t is what? That's V again, so that's V. And look at this, we have a B and a B, an L and an L, a B and a B. So we get uh, minus BLV squared over R. So what have we just shown? How does that compare to this? same thing. Here we lose it, here we gain it, right? Energy's all there. So we've been able to calculate that energy's conserved, right? So we found that the energy that is lost from the Ke to the, of the bar required a little bit of physics 1, physics 2 combination, but we've been able to show that the energy lost from the kinetic energy of the bar equals the energy lost from the resistor to the environment, so it's nice to see that the energy is all there, right? We take the energy from one place and put it in another place. But here's the thing. We can imagine what would happen if the induced current was not the way that Lenz's law said, and we find some very awkward thing with energy conservation. Check this out, okay? What if the induced current did not flow this way? What if we very innocently said it flowed that way? The whole thing would come falling down like a house of cards. Here's why. If the induced current was not this way but this way, what's the direction of the force going to be? With the motion. So we go up to the bar, we give it a kick, and instead of slowing it down, it speeds it up. So we have something very strange where this bar is simultaneously speeding up, but there's also current, which means that this is outputting energy to the environment. So where is this energy coming from, right? How can we take and add to both of these? And I'm, I'm talking not about it's not chemical energy. I'm talking about giving the bar a kick, walking away, and finding myself with a perpetual motion machine where the, where the bar is going faster and faster and faster, and there's energy coming out the other end in heat. So I'm creating energy out of nothing. You can see the problem with this, right? If Lenz's law was not the way it was, then you would have this increase while this increase too. So it's really important that Lenz's law has the current going this way because that makes the force against you. And that's important because you take the energy from the bar and send it over here, right? That's why Lenz's law always fights what you're trying to do. It always fights what you're trying to do because it's taking energy from you and turning it into electrical. So it's always a opposition simply because of energy conservation. It's taking what you're trying to do and saying, I'll yoink, I'll take that energy and I'll use it for electrical, okay? So this, of course, violates energy conservation. Which we can't have, 
And so again, Lenz's law is ultimately comes down to energy conservation. It's this idea that it always opposes what you're trying to do because what it's doing is it's always opposing because it wants to take your energy and send it to electrical. That is ultimately why Lenz's Law is the way it is. It's a handy mnemonic, yes, it'll quickly get you the direction of the induced current, but that's why it is the way it is. Okay. It opposes what you're trying to do because it wants to take the energy of whatever it is that you're trying to do and send it to electrical form. And then from there, of course, if you have a resistor, it'll take it to heat, and so on and so forth. So that's the circle of life, right, for energy conservation. If you take it from one place, if you want to put energy somewhere, you have to take it from somewhere else. Okay? Are there any questions on that? Okay, so no perpetual motion machines. Okay. All right. Um, so that is an example of an area change with time. Um, it required moving this side of the loop. Um, sometimes you'll hear this referred to as motional EMF. So I will, there's a vocabulary word that you may hear. Motional EMF. And what they mean by that, of course, is that if you're going to have the uh, loop change its uh, area with time, there is some motion that initiates this. Okay, so there's some motion that causes, that, that sparks off the, the action. So that is uh, an area change, and we're ready to move on to the angle change. Are there any questions before I do that? All right, let's do it. This is my theta change with time. And here I want to just discuss the system. I'm not going to couch it as an example yet because there's a few complications that I need to uh, kind of uh, go through with you. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to have a magnetic field, B external. Again, uniform, constant in time. Nothing going on with it, most boring field possible. And then I'm also going to have a loop of a fixed area. That's not where the action is. Let me draw it. Here's my loop. I'm drawing it diagonal on purpose. And here is how I'm going to create the flux change. I'm going to create the flux change by simply rotating this loop. So I'm going to rotate it like this. So that's going to change the flux <coughs> simply because I'm changing how much or how little the loop is catching, right? So I'm going to rotate this like so. So I'm going to draw it right like this, and then let me also draw it. And again, I can't draw it rotating in place, so I'm going to have to draw it on the right. Um, I don't literally mean that it goes over to the right, I just can't draw it on top of each other. So those are the, probably the two aspects where it's easiest to look at it. So let's talk about the flux change. Okay. So if I have a loop that's like this, right? that's the most flux. So if I'm in the process of rotating up to that, what's happening to my flux? Increasing. My flux here is increasing. And then of course, when it reaches this orientation, it's the maximum. You can't get any more maximum than that. So if I keep rotating in the same direction, what happens to the flux then? It decreases. 
So here the flux is going to decrease. So what you basically see is if I just rotate this loop in a constant direction, the flux is going to increase, decrease, increase, decrease, increase, decrease, right? On and on. All right, so let's reason what happens. So when the flux is increasing, the loop doesn't like that. So we use this lens's law and we say that the uh, B induced is going to want to point more with or against the external. Against. So ideally, it can point like this, right? Here's the problem. It can't point exactly like this because the current can't flow like this. And it can't flow like this because the loop's not like that. We have two options. The can, current can flow like this, around this way, or like this, around this way. But of course, current can't flow unless it's got a path, right? So we can, of course, just pick whichever option would be better. We can have that the current flows like this, and the induced is more like that, or it flows like this, or it's more like that. And we pick one of those two, and obviously we pick the one where the B induced is against as much as possible. So it's going to look like this. So here we say that because the flux is increasing, B induced is opposite B external as much as possible. <coughs> Current still has to, of course, flow in the ring, not just some other random place. All right, so let's go to the other one. The flux is decreasing. So does B induced want to point with or against the external? With, as much as possible, right? It would like to point like this, but current can, of course, flow where there's no loop. So we have one option is for it to flow around like this, and the B induced to point like that, or like this and point like that. And we pick the one, of course, that is most with. So it looks like this. So here, B induced points with the B external as much as possible. And again, the as much as possible is necessary because of the constraints of having to flow actually in the loop. Now, if you look at that induced current, what do you notice about it going from here to here? They reverse directions. It's no surprise, right? Because if the flux is going to increase, decrease, increase, decrease, increase, decrease, the current's going to try to uh, go with and against, with and against, with and against, right? So the current is going to reverse. Okay? So I induced reverses direction. It does not flow at a constant direction the whole time. Sometimes it's flowing one way and sometimes it's flowing the other way. This is the first time we've seen this type of current. And it's called AC, or alternating current. Alternating current. Everything we've done up to this point has been what's called DC, which is direct current. Okay? So that's versus DC, D stands for direct. So if you, of course, look at anything we've done so far, certainly for homework three, you were guaranteed that the current flowed in the same direction. If it was flowing in a given direction through a given resistor, it did that forever. Even when we got to Kirchhoff's rules, Right? Sometimes you would guess a current direction that was wrong, you'd find out that it was wrong at the end, but that was the direction that it always flowed, you just didn't know it. And when we did RC circuits, we of course talked about the current can change its amount with time, but it never reversed direction, right? It flowed in one direction, it was direct current, it just slowed down the amount over time, right? So this is the first time we're really seeing that current that's flowing one way at one time might go the other way later on. So we're just going to touch this the tip of the iceberg because managing a current that goes back and forth is a lot harder than when it's just flowing in one direction. Right? So I'm um, just going to touch this just a little bit. 
But this is important to understand because when you plug something into the wall, it's AC. It's not DC, okay? And we'll talk about why that is. Why would they use AC if it's harder to work with? Well, it's a big, that's a big loaded question, and we'll address it probably next lecture. Um, so, let's work out the details. So we get a rough sense of the current and why it reverses direction. That's just Lenz's law. So, let's go ahead and go to the equation. And then throw in the flux stuff. And of course, um, I can pull a bunch of stuff out of the uh, delta, because it's not actually delta-ing, not changing. Um, I'm going to pull n out of there, the number of loops isn't changing, but I don't want to set it to 1, because even though I've set it to, if, if this might look like a single ring, in practice, there are, this is usually a coil, okay? So there's a large number of these. Um, the magnetic field itself is not changing. The area of the loop isn't changing. The only thing that's actually changing is the theta. The angle between the normal line and the external magnetic field. Now this is a bit awkward because the thing that's changing is inside a cosine. So we're going to have to unravel what to do there. But the one thing I do want to characterize is that the angle, so the angle, let me again remind you how we measure that angle. Um, we draw a dotted line like this. And then we measure the angle between that and the external magnetic field. That's your theta. So it changes with time, right? Here's how I want to characterize the angle. Theta equals omega t. Now this requires remembering a little bit about physics 1. Theta is the angle, and then omega is the angular speed. Does this ring a bell? So this is basically saying that I can hit the angle in radians usually by taking the rotation rate in radians per second and multiplying it by the amount of seconds. So seconds cancel. It's really the angular version of distance equals rate times time, right? If I want to know a distance traveled in meters, I multiply the meters per second times seconds, and I have it, right? This is, of course, assuming a constant rate. So no acceleration, which is what I'm going to assume. I'm going to assume that there is an externally supplied constant rotation rate. So some outside source is where this loop is getting its rotation. So somebody has figured out a way to rotate this loop. Maybe a hand crank. I'm going to show you this in just a second. I have one of these with me. So somebody has chosen to rotate this loop. And by the way, this equation, of course, does assume that at t equals 0, I start at 0 angle. But that's not really relevant, because uh, I often don't care about what happens at t equals 0. I care about the fact that I'm changing it over time, and that's where I'm going to get my EMF. So I go ahead and I put that in here. This will give me a uh, um, how to figure out what the angle is. What is the angle between the normal line and magnetic field? I just have to supply what is the constant rotation rate that is being supplied, and then I have to sub in what time is it that I'm interested in. Okay, so. The question is, what do I do with this? This is clearly changing with time, right? As time changes, this number gets bigger. But I have it trapped inside a cosine. So this is where, if you've taken the slightest bit of calculus, 
you can see what the answer is going to be to this. Or if you've never even heard of calculus, this will be magic. Okay, this becomes omega sine omega t. So this is again calculus or if you prefer magic, okay? Doesn't matter because this is not a calculus based course. I'm just telling you the result and we're going to use it. It's on the equation sheet. Don't worry about how that step works. Okay? So what do I have? EMF equals NBA omega sine omega t. That is the equation for how much EMF will be generated. Let's make heads or tails of what this is saying. So the first thing I want to remind you, I know you guys have all seen a sine function, right? Sine is this oscillating thing. And it bounces back and forth between top values of what? What's the, the highest value of a sine? One. one. And the bottom one is one. negative one, right? So if you want your oscillation to not top out at plus one or minus one, you multiply it by something, and that's here. So this is going to actually set how big this uh, oscillation is. This, I'll call it E max. So let me sketch it for you. Here's what it looks like. What does the EMF look like with time? It looks like this. Sometimes it's positive, sometimes it's negative. It grows to a maximum value of plus and minus whatever the multiplier is. And by the way, if we want the current, well, this is just Ohm's law. All we have to do is divide that function by resistance. So we get NBA omega over R is now the peak. And I can sketch that. It looks exactly the same. But hey, it looks graphic. There we have it. So this is the first time where we're getting a negative current. We've seen this before with Kirchhoff's rules, but that was just, oh, whoops, it came out negative because we guessed wrong on its direction, right? Well, with AC, by the way, the current reverse directions, and we're seeing that now, uh, here's, here's how it works. When we have DC, we have something like this. And of course, we know that current flows like this from higher voltage to lower voltage. And it always flows that way. And we just call current positive, because why not? It's always flowing in that direction, so we call that positive direction. With AC, We draw the source of EMF, not like a battery. The battery, of course, is, has a higher voltage terminal, a lower voltage terminal, and that's constant. The way we draw an AC source is like this. It's a little circle with a squiggle in it, and the squiggle is, of course, just representing the, the sinusoidal nature. So if you connect that to something, Sometimes it will send current this way, and we would call that current direction positive. So at this moment, it's acting like a battery where the higher voltage terminal is over on this side. 
But then later on, it reverses and sends current the other way. So later on, it will send current the other way. And in this case, we'll call that direction negative, right? So now, this source is acting like a battery with the higher voltage terminal on the other side. So that's, of course, why we need to not draw it like a normal battery where the high voltage terminal is identified because which way is the higher voltage and which way is the lower voltage switches with time. So this is what it does later. So this is, say, at earlier and then later, and then it'll just reverse back and forth. So now negative current really has meaning. Positive current means it's flowing one way, and negative current means it's flowing the other way, and, that, and it just washes back and forth like that. Okay? So that's what it means over here. Whenever the current is positive, current is flowing one way, and whenever the current is negative, it's just washing the other way. Question? And is that switching back and forth the rate that you'll see on like, transformers where it's like 60 hertz? That's, that's exactly right. That's, that's what the, uh, the omega here is going to be. It's going to be the rate of uh, the rotation. Um, so this is measured in radians per second, but you can translate that, that into a uh, cycle per second. Um, so as far as what I want you to understand about the sloshiness, I just want you to understand the, that this part, right, the sine of theta part here, that's the sloshes back and forth, okay? I want you to understand that conceptually, concept. I'm not going to have you use this full equation at all, okay? What I am going to ask you is what sets the, how big does this oscillation go to one side versus the other side? So this part, the part I haven't read, okay? So that's going to determine how big of an EMF do you have a chance to grow sloshing current in one direction versus in the other direction. Okay, so let me take a look at this part. This is going to determine basically how big of a, of a voltage source do you grow in one direction, how big of a voltage source do you grow in the other direction, and of course at times in between it's just transitioning between them. Okay. So this is going to determine the maximum voltage you have applied at any given, or at any point in the uh, rotation of the current loop. So, let's look at ways you can make that bigger, right? First of all, large number of turns. Large number of turns always means that you get more of an effect, okay? So, here I have this device, and let me, uh, there is a current loop inside there, and in fact not just one, but there are probably several thousand turns, right? So the N is a large number, okay? If you look inside, I know you can't see it from there, it's you basically have to come up close and take a look at it. There's a large number of turns. If you want this to be as large as possible, what about the magnetic field? Is that, what, that big or small? We want big. Remember, you're trying to get as big of a flux change as possible. So the way that you get a big as flux change as possible is that when you're catching flux, the flux is big. And then, of course, if you rotate the loop into an orientation where it's the wrong orientation, you get none. So you're switching between big flux, none, big flux, none, big flux, none you're going to get a big flux change and that's going to create larger EMF. So, this thing, by the way, uh, surrounding it is one, two, three, four, five horseshoe magnets. Not just one, but five. So you can get as big of a magnetic field as possible. Horseshoe magnet. Let me uh, sketch this out. This thing is. So I have a bunch of loops like this. I have a bunch of horseshoe magnets. Horseshoe magnet is just a way to bend the north and south pole like that. And remember, magnetic field point from north to south. 
So basically in the region of the, uh, of the loop, they look like that. And of course, magnetic field lines always form closed loops, but I'm not going to draw those closed loops because I don't need to see the rest of the, the field. I only need to see the part that's relevant to the, the current loops. Okay, area. Do you want the area to be bigger or smaller? Bigger. Now, those can only be so big because I need to be able to carry this up here. Okay. And perhaps most importantly, if you don't rotate at all, right? If you're not actually rotating, then you're not actually making a change in time, so nothing happens. So it's important that you rotate the loops in the first place, and the faster you rotate them, you're going to get more EMF, right? That's the only one I actually have control over, by the way, in this apparatus. The n, the number of loops, is built in. The magnetic field is built in by the magnets that are here. The area, can't change the area of the loops, but I can choose how fast to rotate them because you can see that there's a hand crank attached to this loop. So right now, what I have, this hand crank attached to these loops, it's just a coil of wire, I have some magnets, and I'm going to fight, figure out whether I have current in those loops generated by attaching those to a light bulb. Right now I don't get anything, of course, because I'm not making a flux change, right? I'm not changing the flux because I'm not rotating the things. So if I rotate the loops, I should get EMF. EMF drives current. Current dissipates heat, right? And the faster I rotate them, the more current I should get. So let me try it. This thing has seen better days, so I'm going to have to turn off the lights. Hopefully you can see something. <laughs> you see it glowing just a little bit? <laughs> you have to look real close. Hold on. I'm getting so much friction in my hand here. Ah, that's the best I can do. It, trust me, it lit up. <laughs> okay. It did a little. Yeah. So maybe people in the front row can kind of sort of see it. I gotta, I gotta get this thing fixed. Um, but this thing, that's an electric generator, right? That's what it is. Okay. So I need to create, and there's, keep in mind here, there's no external source of electricity. Okay. What I have here is a light bulb, some magnets, and some wire coil, and I'm making electricity. Okay. This thing is an electric generator. You might ask, well, how does the current sloshing back and forth affect this? Well, it doesn't. What does it mean that the current sloshing one way, then the other way, then one way, the other way in the, uh, in the light bulb? It's all going to heat anyway, right? Anytime you send current through there, within either direction, it gets killed to heat. That's like saying you can only rub your hands to get warm by going in one direction. It works both ways. So if the current's sloshing both ways, it still sends it to heat. Um, so, what we have done in this case We have taken mechanical rotation, and of course that mechanical rotation that has some kinetic energy associated with it. It ultimately came from my chemical energy, right? But once we've gotten to mechanical rotation, we have transferred it into electrical current. And the electric generator what it does is that this is the input and this is the output. We put in the rotation and Lenz's law is nice enough to take that and turn it into electrical current. 
You might think that this toy system is nice. Well, this is how all of electricity is generated in some variant of this form, okay? The mechanical rotation in this case was made by myself, came from myself, right? The only thing you need to do when you're generating electricity is figure out some source of energy to get that. So let's talk about various sources of energy. So let's say I have a nice uh, dam here. I have a, what's called a hydroelectric plant, right? How, does they, how do they take the water and use it to make electricity? Well, when they are generating electricity, which is not necessarily all the time, but when they're generating electricity, you'll see water getting let out the bottom of the dam. So that high pressure water is released. What does that do? There is somewhere in that plant, there is a current loop or loops being rotated against some magnets. You're using the water to turn the crank. So here, hydroelectric, right? You're using water pressure to turn the crank and turning in electricity. How about uh, wind? Use wind to turn the crank, right? Maybe you dig a bunch of dead dinosaurs out of the ground, right? Coal, you burn it, use it to make steam, turn the crank, okay? Fossil fuels. You're basically just using, uh, burning something to make steam to turn the crank. Even something as seemingly esoteric as nuclear power, they're just using nuclear fuel to heat up some water, turn the crank. The only one that doesn't really go into this is uh, solar, which works in a completely different mechanism. In fact, solar produces DC. All the rest of this naturally produces AC. So there's lots of different ways to get the energy from, to harness the energy from, but all you're trying to do is use Lenz's law and Faraday's law to turn that mechanical rotation into electrical current. Okay? That's how all electricity is generated. You can have some power lines leading out from here that are carrying that energy. So where does it go? It goes into your house. And what are you going to do? Well, let's say that you decide you want to make yourself a nice fruit smoothie, okay? So, you get yourself some fruit, some frozen fruit, you put them in the blender. What does a blender do? A blender takes electricity in and uses it to turn this blade, right? And the blade will cut up your fruit into smaller chunks and you've got a nice smoothie, right? So, it takes the electrical current and puts it back into mechanical rotation. So that's an electric motor. An electric motor, this is the input, and this is the output. We already talked about that, right? I showed you one of these motors, right, where electrical current is the input, and I use various trickery to cause the uh, magnetic deflection on that current to get a rotation. So I'm just running the process backwards. So this energy starts off as spraying water, and it ends up as rotation of my blender blade. So you might ask, OK, well, if I just wanted to power a blender, why do we have the middleman of electricity? Why don't we could run like a tube of water to my house, right? And just use the tube of water to spray that blade around. Why do we have to put the energy into electricity just to bring it back to the exact form that it was in before. We kind of have this circle where it starts life here and it ends life here. Well, here's the thing. Electricity can be used for lots of things that don't involve mechanical rotation either, right? It can power your radio. You can send it to heat in a space heater or a toaster. The only reason why we have electricity is because it's an extremely convenient way of transporting energy. We put it, energy into a very versatile form. It's easy to transport. It can be used for lots of different things. 
that is the only reason why electricity, why we bother to use it, and why it's such an important part of our everyday lives is because it's a very convenient and versatile, versatile way to transport energy from one place to the other. So while you could theoretically run a tube of water from this dam to power my blender, a spraying tube of water is not going to help me with my toaster or my radio. Right? Okay. So you can see here, this is why electricity is so important. That's why you, even not being engineers or physics majors, need to have some basic understanding for your whatever your future careers are because whatever room you'll be working in will have five different power outlets and there'll be some kind of you know some kind of electrical device you'll probably need to use for your career okay so the that's the electric generator it's basically just running this process in reverse mechanical rotation goes in thanks to lenses and faraday's law we can turn that into electrical current. That's the principle behind the electric generator. Of course, you can then run the process backwards. This we talked about in homework five and six. Like electrical current in can lead to mechanical rotation of output. That's just magnetic deflection. So um, the final order of business is we talked about the fact that you can change the number of loops. That's the last ingredient in flux that we have yet to, to do anything with. And it's going to turn out that the number of loops is going to lead to a thing called an electric transformer. And the electric transformer is really important for the transportation of electricity. So how is it that we get that electrical energy from one place to another? So um, let's leave it there, and I'll pick up the uh, transformer next time.